Nestled between the corneal mountains and the sea is the beautiful Stardew Valley. Resting in the valley lies the tiny village of Pelican Town. But, just as every small town, beneath its cheery and folksy exterior lie dark secrets. Trauma. Infidelity. Rampant capitalism. But one man stands above the rest as the most evil, most sadistic, darkest being in all of Stardew Valley. And his name is Clint. What, you thought Mayor Lewis? That's Junior League political corruption. That's nothing. Clint is so much worse. For anyone who doesn't know, Clint is the village sad sack. He spends his days moping around the village wishing a girl would just talk to him, but never actually trying to talk to a girl himself, and stalking poor Emily, an artistic and too kind for her own good woman who tries her best to let him know that she's not interested in a man that's almost 20 years her senior, but with little success. Take it like this, if there was a computer in his house, Clint would spend all day on 8chan complaining about how ugly he is and how he'll never attract a girl. If there was a choice between pills, Clint would scarf down the black one. To put it bluntly, Clint is an incel loser who doesn't seem to understand that it's not that the world is unfair and out to get him, but that he's put no effort into bettering his own life and is reaping the rewards of his own actions. And because of this, I hate him. He hasn't made a single independent decision in his entire life. Hell, according to his own dialogue, he didn't even choose to be a blacksmith. His dad was a blacksmith, his granddad was a blacksmith, his great-granddad was a blacksmith. He just went along with the family business because it took no effort on his part to get the foot in the door, and he hates it! He even moved to a town with zero local competition so nobody could complain about how much he sucks at his job. The only decision this man has ever made in his life was to wear his good shoes to go see some jellyfish and nobody even noticed. I hate this man so much that, just to spite him, I resolved to completely rebuild Pelican Town's community center without his help. That means no opening geodes, no buying ore from his store, and no upgrading tools. In fact, I'm going to take this a step further. I'm not even going to use any of his tools. No axe, no pickaxe, no watering can, and no hoe. Any tool that Clint has the possibility to touch, I will not be using just to prove how useless he is. How will I pull this off? I'm not sure, but I am a man of science, and through science, all things are possible. I started my day as anyone does, inheriting a large plot of land from my late grandfather, quitting my job, and moving to a small town in the middle of nowhere full of eligible bachelors and bachelorettes. And here is where the challenge begins. With only a scythe to use, the parsnip seeds that Mayor Lewis gifted me as a housewarming gift were only good for selling for a bit of cash. I set about exploring the town and introducing myself to my new neighbors and foraging through the woods for things to sell. I tried to clean up my farm as best as I could, but uh, gave up. Without tools, I would need to buy my basic supplies such as wood and stone from Robin in order to craft anything, and because of this, I needed to find an easy way of making as much money as possible. Fishing is probably one of the best skills in the game. It has a wide loot table with a variety of necessary materials ranging from stone to iridium ore, and even the trash you pick up can be recycled into better items or just given to someone you hate. Here you go, man. However, this is a tedious activity. While it doesn't require your full attention, it does take a long time. This was particularly tedious due to the fact that I couldn't actually get rid of my tools in my inventory and was unable to harvest any wood to make a chest to store them in. But unfortunately, I can't get rid of them. Uh, because <laughs> they won't let you throw away your vital tools. Every second of every day was spent with my rod in my hands. I would sit on the dock in front of Willie's shop and fish. When I would run out of bait, I'd sell my fish to Willie and buy more bait and repeat the process until nightfall. I fished and I sold. And 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 I fished and I sold. Money became no object to me. I bought enough wood to make a chest to store my tools and expand my inventory. And this is the graveyard where these tools shall rest for all time. I bought drinks and dinner for the townsfolk at the pub every night. I even expanded my house without putting a dent in my finances with my fish profits. You know what? Just for the heck of it. Since money is no object for me right now, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. I, I can't believe I'm doing this right now. Upgrade my house. <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. Mayor Lewis showed me the community center, a dilapidated building full of promise, and home to magical forest creatures called Juminos. 
And by making sacrifices, uh, I mean offerings to these benevolent spirits, I can restore the community center and bring balance to the forest, or, or something, I guess. Who wrote this script? Between my fishing and foraging, I quickly filled several bundles with ease. Every Friday and Sunday, the traveling cart would stop by to sell their wares, sometimes carrying more items to please the forest gods. Slowly, bundles were being completed. The first room was completed. The vault. It was a simple matter. Just a couple of piles of money to restore the bust. No problem for a humble fisherman like me. But from here on, things were going to get complicated. I made a terrible mistake when I completed my first bundle by selling the spring mix seeds that I had gotten as a reward Sell for those. some quick cash. I should have saved them to trade them to the desert trader in exchange for winter seeds, because with no hoe, I had no way to obtain the snow yam and winter root from under the snow. I could farm them from the monsters in the ice levels of the mines, but at this point I still had not set foot in them and had no way down even if I had. Luckily, I had leveled up my foraging enough to craft my own spring seeds before the season ended. The community center was going well, and the spirits were in a joyous mood. But I was getting sick of fishing. While it is true I could have just continued on this route and possibly succeeded in rebuilding the community center, it was based completely on luck from fishing treasure chests, the traveling cart, and a magical chair to get me into the secret woods to farm slimes. I needed a better way, and that way right. was bombs. I had chosen the beach farm for a reason. Occasionally, a supply crate will wash up on your shore. Break them open for some goodies. One of these goodies is bombs. <gasps> these are the only way for me to be able to till soil or clear my land. I had been lucky enough for one supply crate full of cherry bombs to wash ashore and for the traveling cart to sell me a single one. But unfortunately, I wasted them. I'm thinking they would be more common than they were by planting a few rice plants in an effort to raise my farming level. I knew the desert merchant sold regular bombs, however, he only accepted raw quartz as payment for them, a resource that can only be found in either geodes, which only Clint can break open and screw that guy, or lying on the ground in the mines, which I had no access to. I needed another way into the mines, which it turns out the desert merchant has as well. The desert merchant has a rotating stock of items that changes depending on the day. And it just so happens, on Sunday, he sells stairs, an item that creates an instant ladder in the mines, allowing you to descend without a pickaxe. Normally, no sane person would purchase these. These can be crafted by anybody with level 2 mining and 99 stone, something most people would already have by the end of their first day in the mines. But I would need a minimum of 5 stairs to even start gaining mining levels. Thankfully, he will trade you his stairs for a single jade, and I already had a crystallarium, a machine that would allow me to create infinite copies of a single gem. I had received it as a reward for completing the 25,000 G bundle in the community center. Unfortunately, I had already gifted the only jade I had found in my many hours of fishing to Carolyn. So back to fishing I went. I just want to give you an idea of how long I had to fish for and how much of a time sink it actually was. And to do that, I need to tell you how I recorded this series. You see, a day in Stardew Valley is a set time. A full day from 6am to 2am clocks in at exactly 14 minutes and 20 seconds. This time will vary by a few minutes each day depending on how long you spend in menus, how many times you transition between areas of map, or by doing activities that cause time to stop. Like fishing. To make things simple for myself, I recorded this series in blocks of one week at a time, Monday to Sunday, meaning that my recording file should end up at around an hour and 45 minutes each. Looking back at my recordings, on the weeks that I didn't fish, those files averaged out to an hour and 50 minutes. However, on the weeks that I did fish, those recording sessions clocked in at an average of 2 hours and 30 minutes, meaning that fishing added a 45% increase in time. This didn't really have anything to do with the challenge, I just thought it was interesting that there was an actual tangible difference between days that I fished and days that I didn't, and I thought I'd share. Anyway, where were we? Ah, yes, looking for Jade. Which means more math. Now, there is a way to manipulate the drops from treasure chests. Each fishable tile in Stardew Valley is assigned a value, and depending on the value, this will adjust the loot table. Some items in fish will appear more or less often based on the value of the square that you fish from, while some only appear in certain values. Jade will only drop from a treasure chest if the square that you fish it out of has a value of 3. And even then, there is only a 4% chance for it to drop. Now, my original plan was just to fish as usual, but aim for level 3 areas. But with no way to tell if I was aiming consistently, I decided to try a different tactic. My next idea was to aim for this specific piece of seaweed that I knew sat in a level 3 tile. 
but after hours of fishing and all of this effort, all I succeeded in catching was a legendary fish, an 18% chance drop, three broken tridents, a 0.6% chance to drop each, Neptune's Glaive, a 0.6% chance to drop, a treasure chest, a 0.24 chance to drop, and a strange doll, a 0.12% chance to drop. This is all statistically improbable, but I have the footage to prove it. Maybe it was my aim that was off, but at the very least, I needed a different tactic. That's when I noticed this spot on the map in the river in town. A nice big area of six level three tiles all stacked up next to each other with an easy reach from the bridge. And sure enough, in just a few minutes from fishing off this bridge, I had enough jade to buy my stairs. I got it. The age of the fish was over. The age of the mine had begun. Now, the long-term goal for the mine was, of course, to make it to the bottom. But for the moment, I was shooting for floor 10. Floor 10 is where Duggies begin to spawn. Mole-like creatures that chase you from under the dirt. They aren't the most dangerous creatures in the mine, but they are the key to my success. Duggies can drop a variety of items, from ancient artifacts to dwarven relics to geodes and bombs. But I thought you were looking for quartz for bombs. Yes, I, I was. But at this point, I was looking for every bomb I could get my hands on. Washed up on shore, bought from traders, and farmed from monsters, bombs are the only way I can consistently till my soil, clear my land, and harvest precious metals. <gasps> I can get mining levels. Oh my god, I can make cherry bombs. <gasps> oh, that's going to help so much. They are vital to the rest of my playthrough. The more, the better. But if you're looking for easy access to bombs, why don't you just buy them directly from the dwarf? While it is true that you can buy bombs directly from the dwarf, you first need to find and donate all four chapters of the Dwarven Translation Guide to the museum. Well, I've got two chapters of the Dwarven Guide. Some of these chapters only drop from specific monsters deep in the mines at a 0.5% drop rate. I hoped I would eventually find all four chapters and have easier access to bombs, but in the meantime, this was the best I could do. I purchased some stairs from the Desert Merchant and headed down into the mines, That's managing to day. unlock the elevator all the way down to level 15. Over the next few days, my time spent in the mines boiled down to a simple loop. Use the elevator to go down as far as I can into the mines, kill monsters, and pick up any minerals that I find, hoping to unlock the next floor. Descend as much as possible, and when that was impossible, exit the mine to okay. reset and do it all again. It was a quick and efficient process. After a few days of mining, I was lucky enough to make my way down to floor 20, where I would take the first step in my master plan. You see, this may surprise you, but the end goal of Stardew Valley isn't to fix up the community center, or fill the museum, or marry the prettiest person in town. I got your favorite. No, the point of Stardew Valley is to eventually not have to play Stardew Valley. Let me explain. In the game, you can separate your income into two groups, active income and passive income. When you first begin the game, you're stuck with active income, fishing, foraging, mining, and farming. These take up a lot of time, leaving little room to socialize with the town folk or do other activities. But as you progress in the game, you'll slowly begin turning these active incomes into passive incomes. You'll make sprinklers to water your crops, buy gatherers to milk your cows, casks to turn your fruit into wine. Heck, you can even enslave the forest spirits to harvest your crops for you. Meaning the only thing left for you to do is to plant seeds once a month and check your preserve barrels once a week as you rake in millions and drink away your depression at the bar. What I needed to do at this point was to start turning all of this active harvesting I had been doing into passive harvesting. And what I needed wasn't money. That was easy enough to get. What I needed was resources. Bombs were still the number one thing I needed in order to finish this challenge, and I currently had three methods to obtain them. I had exchanged the jade in my crystallarium for a quartz, allowing me to obtain two free quartz a day, which the desert merchant would take in exchange for bombs. I could gather them from both the shores of my farm as well as the monsters in the caves, and I could craft them from the resources I gathered in the mines and fished out of the water. But all of this wasn't enough. I needed bombs not just to mine minerals, but to clear my farm so I could have enough space to build new buildings and plant crops. And with trees needing at least 10 bombs to completely clear out of the way, I wasn't gathering them anywhere near fast enough. I needed to find a better way, and that better way was fishing. 
If you look through Robin's build menu, you'll find a fish pond. And while you may think that it's nothing more than some kind of decorative item, it is actually one of the weirdest items in the game. Many of the fish in Stardew Valley seem to have magical properties and not just their ability to live in lava. Many species of fish have the ability to manifest materials out of thin air. For the most part, all you're going to get from these fish is roe or fish eggs, which you can either sell for profit or put in a preserved barrel to age it and increase its value. But some fish have the ability to create rare gems and other materials. Here on floor 20 of the mines, I could find the ghost fish, which can create quartz, which I can trade in the desert for bombs, and the stone fish, which can create copper, which I can craft into cherry bombs, as well as stone, which I can harvest for stairs to delve deeper into the mines. While yes, this isn't the most efficient way of harvesting materials, and the ponds would need to be upgraded before they started giving me anything useful, what I lost in productivity, I made up for in time. Time which I could use for more important things. However, while I was clearing out land for more fish ponds and gathering quartz in the mines whenever I ran out of bombs, I managed to make better progress than I had anticipated. And by the first week of winter, I managed to get deep enough in the mine to gather an item I honestly thought I wouldn't be able to get my hands on for the entire challenge. Hey! Oh! 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 We're going to the museum right now! That's the best thing that's dropped from this mine, Z in mind yet! Now, this is the real test. This is the real test. Because technically, so here is this impenetrable wall. And usually you need at least a steel pickaxe to break through it. However, uh, however, you can bomb through it. But I've never bombed through it without first having the steel pickaxe. So I don't know if this will work. So we're going to go ahead and try. Yes! With yes! this shot now open to me, I now had access to the <gasps> easiest source of bombs in the game. Dwarf! Dwarf, look at this. Look at this. This is a little dwarf guy. Little dwarf guy. Oh, it's beautiful. Now, I wasn't going to tear down my fish ponds. After all, they were a decent source of passive income, as well as the fact that my American heritage leaves me with the irresistible urge to stockpile explosives, and the more bombs I had access to, the better. But in the meantime, I needed to get my hands on enough capital to fund the destruction of the forest that had infested my land, and since petitioning the U.S. government to include me in their overinflated defense budget was out of the question, that meant I would need to fish. <laughs> By winter, I had cleared enough of my land to plant my winter seeds in order to finish the winter foraging there bundle. There we go. Using the materials I gathered during my carpet bombing campaign, I built a coop to keep chickens. And by petting them every day for five experience each and harvesting their eggs for another five experience each, I was able to level up my farming skill to craft sprinklers, mayonnaise machines, bee houses, and finally, preserve jars, allowing me to turn the fish eggs I had been saving from my fish ponds into preserved roe and caviar. My farming operations expanded. More ponds, a coop, a barn, and animals. I had enough bombs to satisfy my needs at last. However, it did come with a few dangers. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! The world of Tokyo Tomare! That didn't happen. <laughs> Spring came, allowing me to finally farm with some efficiency using the sprinklers that I had bought from the traveling merchant throughout the past year. My passive income overtook my fishing and I hung up my rod, no longer needed to sustain my destructive needs. I spent my days instead bribing the locals by giving them oh, trinkets Emily. and fulfilling quests. I have another present Some of for these you. quests gave rewards like a I farming computer, a but there was one quest that I was waiting to appear, and it finally did. This quest is the one favor that I had decided I would do for Clint before I had even started this challenge. And there's a few reasons why. One, the motive. Clint wants me to hunt 50 of a random type of monster for him. In this case, grubs. Grubs? Really, man? They are literally the easiest enemy in the game. I don't even think they do damage. And is willing to pay through the nose for me to do it. And if there's anything that gives me joy in game, it's being able to flex my entire chat aura in Clint's face as he cowers in fear. Two, this is one of the few quests in game that give you no friendship points. So, no matter what, his friendliness will not increase with me if I do this. And three, as a reward, he gives you the blueprints for a machine that renders him near obsolete. The Geode Breaker, a machine that breaks geodes open for the low price of a piece of coal. So if you think about it, Clint just paid me to never have to deal with his crap. 
while also allowing me to demonstrate my alpha male abilities to the world, which I'll consider a giant win. So I spent a solid week sitting next to the machine, breaking open hundreds of geodes that I had stashed away since the start of this run, donating stones to Gunther at the museum, gifting the precious gems to the village residents, and selling the leftovers. The game had gone from an active activity that I needed to participate in to a waiting game, standing by and watching the few crops I had, hoping they would grow into gold star products for the quality bundle, because if they didn't, I would need to await an entire year before I could attempt to complete the quality bundle again. I upgraded my buildings, increased the variety of my livestock, planted fruit trees, and inched closer and closer to completing the community center. The last few bundles were slowly being completed until finally on the 15th day of fall year two, <gasps> I'm done! I'm done! The last item was delivered. Oh! <laughs> I did it! I have done it! I... I can't believe I did it! That That's... That's... Actually kind of cool that this is possible. I had done it. I had completed the community center with no tools and no help from Clint. The townspeople celebrated my accomplishment, showering me in admiration. As for me, I celebrated by marrying the prettiest girl in town, Leah. Oh, come on. I wasn't going to marry Emily just because it would crush Clint's fragile ego. That would make me no better than him. So what did I think of this challenge? Honestly, I loved it. It was a great twist on the way to play this game. I had to think in new ways, try new tactics. Heck, I bought things that I think no Stardew Valley player has ever bought before. I can honestly recommend doing this challenge to anyone who's looking for a little more difficulty in their game. In fact, I'd love to see a no tool category on speedrun.com. I honestly think I could have finished this by spring year two if I had prioritized my time a little better. And looking back, I didn't even need to keep the starting sickle to finish this challenge. I could have just grabbed the golden one of the cave behind the quarry to harvest wheat and bought animal feed from Marnie rather than harvesting my own. The only reason that I had kept it in the first place was that I thought my only real way of gaining farming XP in the early game was to farm rice, but that ended up a total bust anyway. However, reflecting back on this has made me wonder, could I take this challenge further? Are there things that I could do in this game to further cement how useless Clint really is? I'll keep this farm and maybe come back to it another time. But until then, if you have an idea for a challenge for me to try, Go ahead and leave it in the comments, and you may just see it in a future video. Do the things if you want to, and remember, have a good day. I can't believe he put that stupid joke in. I mean, come on. Everybody knows that the world can only stop time, not reverse it. It's Killer Queen's ability bites the dust that can reverse time. What an idiot for getting such a simple fact wrong on the internet. Dislike.